Thanks for having me here. Um, let's get started. Okay, so this is joint work with my student, Rojan Reswan, my ex-student, Yifeng Tang, and my colleague, Christos Zamos, uh, over at Wisconsin. Uh, and it's uh, very new work. It's available on the archive, uh, if you'd like to see. Um, so let me start by describing the setting uh, we're looking at. So we have a seller that has many items for sale, and we're going to have multiple buyers drawn from some population. So the value functions of these buyers are going to be drawn from some independent, some distributions that are independent across buyers, the standard setting. And we're specifically looking at uh, the, the situation where buyers are unit demand uh, in the setting. So each value function is going to map the set of items. We assume there are M items uh, to some number like here in this example. And every buyer is interested in buying just one of the M items. And so the mechanism uh, in general takes these value functions and maps them to allocations and payments. Uh, and of course, the buyer's objective, each buyer's objective uh, is the standard uh, utilitarian objective. We maximize the value minus the price they pay and the seller's objective is going to be to maximize their revenue. Okay, so the very standard revenue maximization setting in uh, mechanism design. Okay, and our goal is to try to figure out, you know, what do these revenue optimal mechanisms look like uh, in this context? Okay, so uh, as many of you may be familiar, uh, revenue maximization in these kinds of settings, uh, multi-parameter settings where we have more than one item can be uh, really, really challenging to uh, characterize. So uh, in particular, we can think of, uh, if we just think of a single buyer or, uh, drawn from some population, we can think of a mechanism as basically displaying a menu of possible allocations along with the prices that the uh, seller charges for uh, those allocations. And it turns out that uh, this menu can contain randomized uh, allocations uh, that are also called lotteries like this one. You, know, you get each item with some probability. And in fact, uh, Hart and Nissan showed that this sort of optimal menu can have infinitely many options. So it can be a very complicated uh, menu, the optimal menu. Uh, but also furthermore, we cannot hope to approximate it via any sort of simple mechanism. This is one example of a result that's known in this area. Uh, there are distributions and uh, this happens even if we're just talking about a single buyer and just two different items. There are distributions where uh, the uh, gap between what you can do with the optimal randomized menu and the optimal deterministic menu, meaning no randomized options, this can be uh, completely unbounded. And furthermore, if you replace this deterministic revenue by something simple like, you know, a, a mechanism or a menu of bounded description complexity, you still get a gap which is infinitely large. Okay, so this uh, leads to this uh, very uh, challenging situation where we cannot hope to um, uh, get close to the optimum uh, in general. And there's been a, a long line of very beautiful work on making assumptions on the buyer's value function and the buyer's value distribution uh, in order to uh, obtain uh, positive results here in terms of bounded gaps. Uh, and I'm not going to review all of that work uh, uh, because our focus in this talk is going to be a little bit different. So what is our focus in this talk? We want to figure out how to make this uh, problem tractable by limiting the power of the seller and by redefining the optimum that we are trying to chase or com compete against. Okay, so to motivate that, uh, let's look at another little example. And here I'm going a little bit beyond unit demand buyers, although uh, the results I'll talk about later are all for unit demand buyers. So here we have three buyers and two items. The, the first one is interested only in the banana at a value of $1. The second one only wants the orange at $1. And the third one individually 
um, uh, values each piece of fruit at $2 and the pair of them at $4. So this the third buyer is an additive buyer. And if you think about it a little bit, uh, here's what the optimal deterministic menu for uh, the setting looks like. It, it charges a dollar uh, for each individual piece of fruit so that the first two buyers uh, you know, will just about be able to afford uh, uh, getting what they want and charges for the bundle of fruit $3. So if you wanted to buy both and you have to pay $3 and then that makes the third buyer indifferent between buying a single piece of fruit or buying the pair. And so the third buyer gets the pair. Okay, so this is uh, an optimal deterministic menu uh, for the setting. And now observe that uh, this menu has this, uh, 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 this, this strange property that it's, it's actually charging more for the pair of fruit than it does for the two uh, pieces of fruit individually. And so uh, one might think of uh, a seller posting this menu as uh, being exploitative uh, in the sense that they're, you know, overcharging for uh, the pair of fruit and, you know, really trying to um, uh, sort of overcharge this, uh, the, this buyer that wants uh, both pieces of fruit. Uh, right, so this is like exploitation taken to its extreme. Uh, and so when we say limit the power of the seller, this is the kind of thing that we're going to uh, disallow. And then we'll see what happens to uh, mechanisms under this constraint. Uh, so uh, we're gonna call these kinds of mechanisms by many mechanisms. Uh, uh, this is you know, a, a term from previous work that I'll uh, review in just a moment. Uh, so the idea is that uh, for a single buyer mechanism, we can imagine that uh, the single buyer interacts um, with the mechanism multiple times in the sense that if you post this menu, the buyer is going to show up at the store uh, many times and uh, purchase uh, potentially multiple options off of this menu and construct uh, uh, the set they want to buy. So for example, um, the buyer could, uh, you know, this third buyer could come to the store twice, buy the banana at a dollar first, and then buy the orange uh, at, at another dollar next, and then get the bundle of these at $2 instead of $3. And when the menu has lotteries in it, then uh, the buyer is going to get an independent draw from each of the lotteries that they buy, uh, and then construct a set of items in that manner. And so essentially what we are saying is that uh, uh, this mechanism here, uh, if it has a, a buy many buyer that uh, arrives at the store multiple times, it's not going to be able to sell this pair uh, of items at $3. Rather, effectively, the price of this pair is going to be $2. Okay. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions uh, if there are any. Okay, so that's the idea. And again, uh, let me emphasize that uh, this buy many property or allowing the buyer to um, have this extra power is not without loss of generality. And that's sort of the point of this definition. It's going to uh, explicitly limit the uh, power uh, of the seller. Uh, and then uh, the hope is that, uh, you know, we can say something meaningful about settings where this property does hold. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are natural examples uh, of settings where this property is, is satisfied. For example, you know, let's take the online retail like amazon.com or your local grocery store certainly cannot limit how many times you go to the store. Uh, but in, uh, in other situations, like let's say, you know, airline ticket pricing, we know that these kinds of exploitative, uh, super additive bundle prices do exist. And so, you know, depends on the kind of market you're in, uh, but we wanna study the kinds of markets where this, uh, this uh, by many constraint naturally arises. Okay, and then uh, the, you know, going forward in this talk, uh, instead of worrying about uh, buyer strategies uh, too much, we're just gonna say that 
uh, you know, we'll take some menu, apply this buy many uh, property or buyer behavior to it and ex uh, get from it uh, a, a, a different effective menu where each option is basically priced at uh, the, the smallest uh, price it takes to purchase that option uh, from the menu and we'll call that uh, a resulting menu by many. So uh, a given menu is by many if it's the case that uh, any option is priced in the cheapest possible manner and cannot be dominated by uh, any uh, adaptive by many strategy where dominator just means cheaper price, bigger allocation. Okay, so just a technical definition. So to look at some examples, already showed you that this one is not by many. This is another example that's not by many. Here's a lottery that gives you a random piece of fruit at $2 uh, and you, uh, an adaptive uh, buyer could just purchase this multiple times until they get the orange. It would take them in expectation $4 to do that. And that would be cheaper than uh, get, buying the orange straight at $5. So this is not by many either. Uh, this menu turns out to be by many just by examination that uh, uh, no option when bought more than once can dominate uh, any other option on the menu. So just a few different examples. Uh, and again, these are uh, not necessarily for unit demand buyers. Uh, but, uh, 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 you know, we'll apply this concept to unit demand buyers. And let me also point out, if you just want a simple concept to think about, uh, by many for uh, deterministic mechanisms, this is, is exactly the same as sub-additive pricing. For randomized mechanisms or, ran or lottery pricings, it's essentially like subadditivity, but you have to uh, carefully define the technical details. Okay, so that's how we're going to limit the power of the seller. And then now the question is, you know, what does it buy us? So what it buys us is that uh, by many mechanisms, uh, can in fact be well approximated. And uh, in fact, uh, a few years back in a result by Moshe and uh, Nissan and Rubinstein, they showed that uh, you know, even for simple distributions like product distributions over additive values, uh, you know, this uh, concept of uh, the by many optimum is strictly weaker than the overall optimum. So it, it is, uh, uh, this constraint is not without loss of generality. Um, and then uh, several years back, we uh, defined this concept in the context of unit demand uh, uh, buyers. And, and we showed that um, in fact, uh, by many revenue uh, can be approximated by item pricing uh, over the uh, uh, items. And this holds for any uh, unit demand value distribution. You don't need uh, further assumptions on what this distribution looks like. And this gap is bounded by, uh, by uh, uh, log of M, where M is the number of items. Uh, and uh, so recall that I said before that the gap between opt and any simple mechanism can be unbounded. So here item pricing is a simple mechanism. And uh, this already shows that this by many revenue can be much uh, smaller than the overall opt. And then uh, in uh, work with Teng and Zamos, we showed that in fact, this result over unit demand value distributions extends to arbitrary value distributions. So there, there are no assumptions on what kind of values the buyer has. It can be, uh, you know, even, um, they don't even have to be sub-additive, uh, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, we still get this O of log M gap between by many revenue and item pricing revenue for M items. And in fact, you can't do better than this O of log M. Uh, in order to beat the log M, you really need a mechanism that has exponential description complexity. 
And then more recently, uh, we have shown that in other settings, you can get even better results. So one example is the FedEx setting where, uh, you know, the uh, without the by many constraint, the optimal mechanism looks very complicated. And there's been a lot of beautiful work on this. But under the by many constraint, it turns out that, uh, you know, by many mechanisms are essentially item pricing. So there's no gap at all. Uh, and this kind of result extends to more generally to ordered settings where, you know, item one is no better than item two, which is no better than item three and so on uh, for any buyer. Uh, and then this gap becomes O of one. So one can get a lot of, uh, you know, nice results uh, or bounded gaps under this by many assumption under uh, various different uh, settings. Um, and, and then one can also show nice results uh, on uh, revenue continuity, menu size complexity, and so on, uh, that don't hold for um, uh, general optimal mechanisms. So uh, the upshot is that uh, the by many constraint uh, is uh, very strong and fairly well understood for these single buyer settings. Uh, but one sort of direction that uh, this previous work left open was uh, extending this uh, by many constraint to multiple buyers. And that's what the current work uh, is about. And that's what uh, I want to talk about next. Any questions at this point? Okay, so let's start thinking about multiple buyers. And it turns out that uh, extending the by many constraint to multiple buyers poses uh, quite a conundrum in terms of buyer behavior. So as I said, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the typical way of describing the by many constraint, and uh, this is true in, in my own previous uh, work on this topic. Uh, typically, this is described as a strengthening of uh, the buyer's power. You know, what can the buyer do in this mechanism? The buyer is allowed to interact with the mechanism multiple times. So therefore, the buyer would buy multiple options off of the menu and can, you know, uh, therefore uh, construct good uh, um, uh, sets of allocations through that. And this is certainly true in the, uh, and so this, this imposes a constraint on the kind of menu the seller can uh, offer to the buyer. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, uh, this naturally holds in the single buyer setting, essentially because, you know, single buyer settings effectively have unlimited supply. So, uh, the, you know, this is the only buyer in the store, yeah, you know, there's uh, uh, the buyer can purchase uh, or whatever they want. When they come back to the store, we're still in this unlimited supply setting, either they've already bought some things or the rest of the things are still available. And the seller is effectively going to uh, offer uh, the same menu to this buyer uh, because we're in this unlimited supply setting. Nothing's changed between different arrivals uh, of the buyer. But when we go to multiple buyers, uh, you know, really uh, the settings of interest become limited supply settings. So buyers ex uh, impose this externality on each other by, you know, purchasing some items. And when the next buyer shows up, uh, you know, there's uh, sort of, uh, uh, there are potentially fewer items left uh, in the store. And what that does is now the seller can actually uh, you know, distinguish between and discriminate across uh, different interactions with the buyer. So what the buyer can uh, see in the store on their first visit is not necessarily the same as what they can they get to see on their uh, subsequent visits. And so the seller can actually change their menu uh, across these different uh, interactions. Uh, and so uh, uh, what that means is, you know, thinking in terms of the buyer's power is not as effective in these limited supply or um, multi-buyer, uh, multi, multi-interaction multi settings. Uh, but the alternate way of thinking about the buy many constraint 
uh, is that uh, we are going to place a limit on the seller's power. So we can think of the mechanism as being a direct mechanism between the seller uh, and multiple buyers. Uh, and then we can capture the interaction, or maybe multiple interactions of, of the seller with the buyer uh, within uh, the framework of a direct mechanism. And then we can ask, uh, you know, is the is the seller being exploitative in the sense of using super additive pricing? Uh, and, and in that context, we can actually uh, talk about, you know, we can actually place a constraint on how powerful uh, the seller is. So uh, as a weakening of the seller's power, uh, this gives us language to be able to extend the by many uh, constraint to these uh, multiple uh, buyer settings. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that, um, you know, in this work uh, or in this talk, uh, I'm not going to claim that one way of looking uh, at this constraint uh, is the right way and another way is not. Really, all of this uh, is up for discussion. And uh, I, uh, you know, in fact, we do welcome your feedback and discussion uh, on this uh, issue. But really, uh, you know, we think of these by many mechanisms as giving us um, a way of asking, you know, how do we uh, define, uh, uh, you know, interaction between the seller and buyers and interact uh, and define the power of the seller and properties of the market in a manner that uh, enables, um, you know, interesting simple versus optimal uh, kind of results in this uh, uh, context. And uh, it's a way of asking, you know, in what sorts of markets do simple mechanisms approximate the optimum and in what sort of markets do they not? Okay, so that, that's the spirit in which we think of uh, uh, trying to pinpoint what the buy many constraint looks like uh, in multi-buyer uh, settings. Okay, so uh, with that background, let's think about how we might uh, uh, formalize the buy many constraint in a multi-buyer context. Um, so here's one potential way of doing this. Uh, so let's imagine that the seller interacts with the buyer one at a time, and every time it interacts with the buyer, it uh, sends a buy many menu to the buyer, and then the buyer selects something off of the menu. So for example, uh, the seller may send a buy many menu to the first buyer here, the first buyer decides to purchase some item from this menu, and now the seller uh, has one less item. Uh, and uh, you know, sends over a buy many menu over the remaining items to the next buyer, uh, the next buyer makes a purchase and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is one way of defining uh, a general buy many mechanism. There's some ordering over the buyers and the seller interacts with each buyer one at a time. An alternate way of defining it is, as I said, in the form of a direct mechanism. So every buyer sends over a valuation to the seller, uh, and then the seller at once determines uh, uh, what uh, allocation and, and payment to charge from uh, each buyer. And now I could look at a single buyer, I could fix everything else in the market, all of the other buyers, and I could ask, at different value uh, profiles of this one buyer, what are the allocation price pairs the seller uh, uh, sends to this buyer? Okay, and then that would be the effective exposed menu and exposed pricing this buyer receives from the seller. And then at that point, we could ask, well, uh, does this exposed pricing satisfy the buy many constraint? And we could require that that exposed pricing satisfies the by many constraint. So that would be one way of applying this by many constraint uh, in an exposed fashion to a direct mechanism. Okay, and then alternately, we could do the same thing, but apply the by many constraint to an ex ante pricing. So I could ask an expectation over other people's uh, values, you know, what is the effective price for each possible allocation that's offered to a particular buyer ex ante. Uh, 
Uh, and then I could require that this ex ante pricing satisfies the binary constraint. And of course, at this point, you can you know define other kinds of um, you know interactions between the buyer and the seller. Just as long as uh, you know there's some effective menu we're looking at, and we're applying the buy many constraint to this effective menu that the buyer is offered. And you know, with all of these different alternatives, uh, the natural question is which definition should we use? Uh, you know, should we try to uh, sort of do a, a simple versus an uh, optimal gap analysis for each of these individually, uh, you know, and try to uh, uh, capture all of these, or is one of them more meaningful than the other? Uh, and I'm going to punt all of those questions. Instead, I'll define for you an ex ante relaxation of uh, uh, this uh, by many revenue that captures you know, each of these uh, settings that I described here and potentially more. Okay, so what's uh, an ex ante relaxation? So by now this is uh, a pretty well established uh, idea in uh, mechanism design and I should have had references here and I just remembered that I forgot to add, add them, but really it's an idea that originated in a paper of Alay uh, from uh, about a decade ago and has found a lot of use and um, some very beautiful results stemming from it uh, since. So the idea is that, uh, you know, the way that uh, buyers, different buyers impose externality on each other is through the, the supply constraint. If buyer one purchases item one, then this item is no longer available for buyer two, for example. So the ex ante relaxation, which is a, a relaxation because it allows for uh, more uh, mechanisms, uh, is to essentially enforce these uh, supply constraints uh, in expectation instead of ex post. So we're just going to say, you know, each item is allocated in expectation once to a reagent, but ex post sometimes it may be allocated twice, sometimes uh, 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 none at all. Okay, uh, and so then what it does is it determines uh, probabilities of allocation for each agent, uh, and then it enforces uh, via uh, independent single buyer mechanisms, it enforces these probabilities of allocation for each agent. Okay, so to be precise, uh, this is what we do. Uh, we're going to find uh, for, uh, so we have buyers indexed by I, we have items indexed by J, we're going to find these probabilities xij and we're going to say that buyer i gets item j with probability at most xij and these probabilities are over all of the randomness in uh, the buyer's valuations okay and also potentially over uh, uh, you know randomness that's contained in the mechanism itself and we'll say that these probabilities are ex ante feasible we'll just call them the ex ante supply constraint and they're feasible if, you know, in expectation, we allocate to each buyer at most one item because we have unit demand buyers and we allocate each item at most once because uh, we have one copy per, per item. Okay, and then we're going to define the optimal ex ante benchmark as being the best revenue we can get from a mechanism that, rep, that uh, respects the, this ex ante supply constraint. And what does this mechanism look? Uh, what does it look like? Well, now that we've you know um, play uh, uh, bound, uh, we've, we've placed a bound on these allocation uh, probabilities. Uh, we can just completely independently look at the revenue that we can get from some buyer I. Uh, and so I'm going to define this uh, by many revenue, the, the most revenue I can get through a by many mechanism from buyer I respecting this ex ante constraint XI. So let me define that. So now we'll think about just a single buyer individually. And we'll say that this mechanism uh, satisfies some ex ante supply constraints. So these are some probabilities of allocation. Uh, and this is going to be with respect to some value distribution B. Uh, so it satisfies this constraint if it's the case that if I look at the probability that a buyer drawn from this distribution is going to buy item J in this mechanism, 
this probability should be no more than uh, what I'm allowed under this ex ante supply constraint. Okay, so of course this, this uh, uh, definition is specific to some value distribution. So, uh, you know, for the same mechanism, if I change the value distribution, these probabilities could change. Okay, so uh, this, this mechanism is feasible with respect to this supply constraint and this distribution, this entire pair. And so then I can define the optimal by many revenue I can get from some buyer I under this constraint XI when the buyer's distribution is DI. Uh, and this is just going to be the most revenue I can get from a mechanism that satisfies this constraint and that uh, is represented by some by many many. Okay, and then summing those over all of the buyers and taking the best possible way of uh, breaking up the supply into these ex ante supply constraints that gives us this ex ante uh, B by many optimal benchmark. Any questions about this? So we can, um, uh, I won't go over this in detail, but uh, one can make note of the fact that the different ways of defining the uh, by many revenue I uh, showed earlier are all captured by this uh, uh, ex ante optimum. Uh, this is uh, greater than or equal to each one of those. Okay. And so what is our main result? Our main result shows that uh, this ex ante benchmark can indeed be approximated uh, via a simple mechanism. And I'll define what this mechanism is. Uh, and this is for unit demand buyers. So specifically, uh, we consider some uh, setting with M items and N unit demand buyers. And each buyer's valuation function is going to be drawn independently from some uh, uh, distribution DI. Uh, but otherwise, these Ds can be completely arbitrary. So in particular, for a, a specific buyer, uh, their value distribution over the M items could be arbitrarily correlated. It could be completely arbitrary. And then we show that uh, the, the revenue of a sequential posted pricing is within a factor of O of log M of the ex ante optimum. And observe that uh, you know, within constant factors, so we, we lose uh, a, a small constant factor here, but uh, um, ignoring that, this is basically the same uh, gap that uh, our previous work uh, from EC19 obtained for a single uh, or in fact, the um, 2010 work uh, with uh, Fries, Kleinberg, and Weinberg uh, obtained for a single unit demand buyer. Okay, so that's the uh, result. And let me say what this sequential posted pricing is. Uh, so basically, uh, this mechanism looks like the following. Uh, it looks at this joint distribution B1 through Bn over the buyers. And it considers a fixed ordering over the buyers, uh, some arbitrary but fixed ordering. So uh, you could specify some ordering uh, for the mechanism to consider. And then given this information, it's going to compute pricings. So each uh, pricing here is specific to some buyer. So P1 is uh, a, a vector of prices over the items uh, offered to buyer one. P2 is a vector of prices over items offered to buyer two and so on. And what it's going to do is it's going to offer these pricings in sequence to the N buyers. Uh, and when we arrive at buyer I, the previous uh, I minus one buyers have already purchased a few items and we're just going to offer the remaining items at uh, the prices specified by this pricing. And then the buyer is going to instantiate their value and purchase some uh, item at this price. So that's how this price uh, should change. Yes. I have uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. One, um, those prices are determined upfront. They are not changed dynamically after some items are purchased. 
That's correct. So that's a great question. So the prices, uh, and I was just going to mention that the prices are determined upfront and they don't change uh, as uh, items are bought uh, 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 down the line, but they do depend on the ordering of uh, buyers. So if I change my this ordering upfront, then I might compute a different set of prices. Okay, so my other question is, have you considered a setting where the arrival order is unknown? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for that prompt. That's my, that was going to be an open question that I mentioned. So I do, um, uh, our, our technique for proving that this pricing exists does require fixing and ordering over the buyers. And it's not clear that that's necessary. So you could ask, uh, you know, can I compute prices that will work well regardless of the ordering in which the buyers come or may work well for random ordering? And I don't know the answer to that question. I suspect it should be possible. Okay, great. Just an occasional question, if I may add. So with the pricing that you computed at the beginning are like N times M prices, right? It's PIJ. That's right. That's right. So it's a different uh, uh, pricing for every buyer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And let me uh, add here that, uh, you know, we can go back and look at uh, where sequential poster pricings have come up elsewhere in the literature. And as I mentioned, there's, you know, a long line of work on uh, approximating the overall uh, non by many uh, optimum through simple mechanisms under further assumptions on the value distribution. And for example, when values are independent across items for different uh, buyers, then uh, we showed previously that, uh, in fact, the gap between op the optimum and the same kind of sequential item pricing uh, is O of 1. So I want to emphasize that this is really the same kind of sequential posted pricing that has come up in, in uh, literature before, uh, although the, in this other uh, context, the prices were independent of the ordering over the buyers, but we they still needed to be, um, you know, different pricings for different buyers and for revenue maximization, you really do need to uh, use non anonymous uh, pricings. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the result and that's the uh, kind of simple mechanism we get. Uh, and in the rest of this talk, I'll uh, say a few words about how we uh, prove this result. So there are two parts to uh, proving this. So first of all, uh, we're going to argue that, uh, so recall that, you know, this, this ex ante uh, objective that we're trying to optimize is composed of these single buyer uh, mechanisms that respect their, uh, uh, you know, respective uh, ex ante supply constraints. Uh, and so our first step is going to be to relate uh, a similar um, uh, uh, quantity for item pricing. Uh, so uh, this item pricing revenue uh, that respects uh, this ex ante supply constraint XI uh, is really defined in the same way as the by many revenue respecting that ex ante constraint. Um, uh, you know, here, this is going to be the maximum revenue that we can get from an item pricing. And this should really say random item pricing because we do allow uh, randomizing this. Uh, and we're going to need uh, randomizing uh, this uh, PI. So we, we have a distribution over item pricings. Uh, and uh, this distribution uh, in expectation satisfies these ex ante supply constraints with respect to uh, the value distribution. Uh, and we look at the maximum revenue that we can obtain uh, under those constraints from buyer I. And uh, again, we uh, can, uh, so uh, he, this first part says that for every buyer, we can find such a distribution over prices that respects the same ex ante constraint. And then for a given ex ante constraint, we show that uh, you know, we can take this uh, ex ante item pricing revenue and we can extract a constant fraction of this using the kind of sequential posted pricing I uh, showed you on the previous slide. Okay, so those are the, the two parts. 
And from a technical perspective, each of these parts uh, poses uh, interesting challenges. Uh, so let me say a few words about the first one here. Uh, so we'd like to show that for a single buyer, so now we're in a single buyer setting, except we have this uh, ex ante supply constraint. We can only sell item I with probability XIJ. And we wanna show that the buy many revenue is approximated by the item price and revenue under this constraint within this factor of log M. Uh, and we'll recall from uh, the previous work that this holds in the absence of any supply constraint or you know, when we just have, uh, we can just sell with uh, any probability up to one for any item. Okay, and so this is this uh, previous uh, result is a natural starting point for trying to prove this statement here. But the problem is that this uh, previous result, uh, you know, it starts with some uh, by many mechanism, it converts it into an item pricing without losing uh, too much revenue, but it gives no control over uh, what items this item pricing sells. And in fact, the allocation of this item pricing could look entirely different from the allocation of this by many mechanism we start out with. And in fact, if we delve into the details of this uh, theorem, you know, this becomes immediately apparent. So in fact, what this uh, previous result shows is that starting with any by many mechanism, there's some item pricing such that no matter what the buyer's value function is, the revenue of this mechanism is not going to be more than a logarithmic factor off from the revenue of the pricing. This is a random uh, pricing. So this is an expectation over this randomness. And because it holds for every possible valuation, there are naturally going to be valuations where uh, you know, this mechanism is allocating something very different from this pricing, unless they're, you know, the, exactly the same mechanism, right? And so the pricing this theorem returns is not going to be able to satisfy the same ex ante constraint uh, as the mechanism M for, uh, uh, in general. So to get around this, but to still be able to leverage uh, what the previous work shows, uh, we uh, look at this Lagrangian relaxation uh, of the problem. So, uh, you know, this ex ante constraint is really a challenging constraint uh, to deal with. Uh, it doesn't leave very much room for being able to define good item pricings. Uh, and so, you know, we simplify it by bringing it into the objective and we say, uh, well, let's try to prove a version of this theorem under costs. So here, uh, our objective, we're given some cost vectors. So every item has some production cost, uh, CJ. And what we're trying to maximize is the revenue the mechanism gets minus the total production cost. So what is that? Uh, the, the, these costs are just linear. So we're just going to charge for every item J, it's cost CJ times the probability this item gets allocated. So this is uh, one way of writing this uh, profit objective under these production costs C. And then our goal is to show that uh, there's for any by many mechanism M, there exists some item pricing P such that the profit of M can be approximated within this factor of log M of the profit of the pricing P. Okay, and if we can prove this for arbitrary costs and arbitrary by many mechanisms and arbitrary valuations, then uh, you know it's uh, very straightforward to go from this claim up to this uh, this one just by looking at uh, by you know defining the costs appropriately. Okay. Okay. So that's great, and and it puts it in a language where we can potentially leverage uh, the previous work. Except it turns out that this is simply not true for arbitrary costs. So. Uh, in fact, we can uh, construct examples where uh, this, this claim just uh, simply uh, doesn't hold. 
Okay, so that poses a problem, uh, but it turns out that a slight variation of this does work. So uh, what we can do is to prove, uh, you know, a, a bi-criteria version of this uh, claim where the, the by-many mechanism faces uh, a higher cost than the pricing. And really the challenge in trying to prove a statement of this sort is that uh, you know, it could be the case that for most items, uh, you know, there's simply no profit uh, to be extracted. And the way that this by many mechanism extracts some profit is to sell the right kind of lottery over multiple items to pair you know, items that, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to basically be able to exploit um, uh, you know, values of these non-profit items to nevertheless be able to discriminate across uh, uh, different values for profit generating items. So that's, that's what happens uh, in here. Uh, but as soon as we penalize the by many mechanism by a little bit, we can, uh, you know, disallow those kinds of um, examples where we have, uh, uh, you know, items that don't generate any profit, but do give information to the by many mechanism. Uh, okay, and so uh, this this follows uh, not immediately from this previous work, but using uh, similar kinds of techniques. Uh, and then this kind of uh, little penalty uh, on the by many mechanism, uh, doesn't affect the rest of the argument and the, the rest of the uh, Lagrangian argument still uh, goes through in a, a pretty standard uh, form. Okay, so that, that's all I'll say about this first part of, the, uh, uh, of our main result. Uh, I think uh, you know, from a technical perspective, this extension of the single buyer uh, gap to uh, the sex ante supply constraint is, is uh, an interesting one in itself too. And then the second part of our uh, result says that once you have uh, an ex ante uh, bound on item pricing revenue, uh, you can get that through this kind of sequential posted pricing I described before. Uh, and so let me say a few words about how uh, we achieve this. Um, so this uh, ex ante bound on item pricing revenue basically looks like the following. We have some uh, ex ante constraints, X1 through Xn on the end buyers, and we have some uh, N different pricings uh, with Nm uh, uh, total number of prices, and each pricing here uh, satisfies the corresponding ex ante constraint uh, X1 through Xn. And so essentially what we do is we uh, uh, you know, follow a, a relatively, a standard uh, sort of profit inequality type of approach here, uh, where instead of satisfying these constraints uh, you know, simultaneously, what we do is we try to satisfy uh, each constraint uh, um, uh, in a sequential fashion, uh, except we leave some uh, uh, probability on the table. So uh, for the first buyer, instead of selling the items uh, to this buyer with probabilities given by X1, we sell with probabilities X1 over two so that we still have uh, enough probability remaining to be able to offer each item to subsequent buyers. And we do this by taking this price vector and setting some of the prices to uh, uh, infinity. So in other words, we just disallow the buyer from purchasing certain items. And, and this set of items that we disallow is drawn from some distribution, some appropriate distribution. Okay, so this is what the pricing we're going to offer to buyer one. Uh, and then we go to buyer two, we look at the random set of uh, items that's remaining for this buyer too. Uh, and we're going to uh, take another random set of items and we're gonna exclude those from uh, buyer two set and we're gonna come up with this pricing Q2. Uh, 
and uh, will ensure that, that this Q2 satisfies the constraint X2 over two. Uh, and then we proceed in this manner until we get to the nth buyer and then the nth buyer uh, you know, also has uh, this pricing where some random set of items is excluded and this uh, satisfies the constraint Xm over two. And the overall, uh, uh, the, the lemma is sort of the intermediate claim that enables all of this is the following. So we look at some uh, buyer I and there's some random pricing PI that satisfies this constraint XI with respect to this buyer's distribution. And furthermore, there's going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, enabled by uh, the purchases of buyers one through I minus one, there's going to be a fixed distribution over item sets SI that are available to this buyer I. And given this uh, distribution, uh, we'll claim that we can find a pricing QI that, that has this kind of form such that the, uh, the expected allocation of this uh, uh, pricing for this buyer is going to be is going to respect this constraint xi over two, and furthermore, the expected revenue is going to be uh, xi over two dot pi. Okay, uh, and recall that the uh, so the, we're talking about uh, item pricings and a unit demand buyer, so the ex ante allocations revenue was xi dot pi. Uh, okay, and so the, uh, the revenue obtained by uh, any QI here is going to be at least half of that. Uh, and so this gives us this theorem, in fact, with a factor of two in here. Okay, so how does this uh, arise? Uh, I'll, uh, uh, let me say a few words about that. So here uh, I'm going to remove essentially all, uh, I'll look at a simpler form of this uh, claim where any randomness uh, is removed. Uh, so we have a fixed pricing P satisfying some ex ante constraint. We have a fixed set of items uh, that uh, is available for this buyer and we want to find some pricing Q that obtains half the allocation of P and that obtains half the revenue of P. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider uh, randomizing Q over uh, these prices where uh, for any potential set T uh, for items in the set, we offer the same prices as P, but for items outside of the set, we just exclude them from the pricing and price them at infinity. And of course, if we look at uh, this item set S that's available to us, there are two to the S possible such uh, pricings, uh, one uh, each corresponding to some subset uh, of the set S. And each of these different pricings gives us some effective allocation over the buyer's distribution. And essentially what we do is we claim that if you look at this allocation vector X over two, this is in the convex hull of these two to the S different possible pricings. And so in particular, there's some distribution over T so that I can write X over two as uh, the, uh, uh, ex the uh, expected allocation under this distribution. And so as this suggests, we you know, basically just take this distribution and we're gonna set Q to be the corresponding price uh, with respect to that distribution over T. And then it becomes easy to see that, uh, you know, because uh, these uh, uh, random pricings either offer the same price PJ for item J or don't sell this item at all, then the revenue of this pricing is just going to be the sum over items of PJ times the probability that this item is allocated. Uh, and that's precisely uh, this uh, the allocation constraint, uh, times the pricing P. Okay, so that was uh, really quick, just to give you a little idea of where this comes about. Uh, and of course, the interesting part here is to say, well, what happens if the item set available is random? And what happens if this pricing is random? And all of that can be incorporated into this kind of proof. Okay.
So to summarize, uh, we start with this ex ante uh, relaxation of the buy many revenue. Uh, and then we show that this is related within a logarithmic factor to the uh, ex ante relaxation of item pricing. And then this item pricing can be achieved with uh, a further loss of a factor of two uh, using uh, a sequential posted pricing where prices are determined upfront. Okay, uh, let me uh, conclude with a few open directions. Uh, you know, these are ordered from the most obvious and immediate to the most uh, ambitious uh, in some ways. So I already mentioned that uh, you know, having uh, order oblivious pricing in this context would be uh, even nicer in terms of you know, enabling results via simple mechanisms. Uh, and, the, and I should add here that uh, uh, like many of the results in this area, this is really uh, a, not a constructive result. It's, it's an upper bound on a gap. So it would be nice to also, um, you know, in general for uh, this literature to also move in the direction of uh, constructive results and, and approximations, uh, approximations over the space of pricings. So that's one uh, direction. Uh, and then uh, uh, all of this work is about unit demand buyers and really the unit demand constraint comes up in both of the components of the uh, argument uh, I showed you. And in some ways it also shows up in how we define uh, the ex ante uh, relaxation, although that can be extended to other um, kinds of buyers. Uh, and so uh, extending these multi-buyer multi mechanisms uh, to other kinds of valuation functions uh, is a, a very interesting direction. And then, uh, you know, I uh, spend a lot of time talking about how we might formalize the by-many constraint. Uh, and again, I, I really think of this work uh, as a start, and there are other potential ways of extending the by-many constraint. And I think this is uh, an uh, interesting direction to think about, uh, as well as you know, thinking more generally about uh, are there other ways to limit uh, the seller's power that also enable uh, the good upper bounds on the simple versus optimal gap in this area. So with this, I'll conclude and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.